Good morning, everyone. A very warm welcome to all of you to today's class. This is Research Writing and Communication course organized by the Consciousness Studies Program at the National Institute of Advanced Studies, Bangalore. So yes, the last session, the previous session was about an introduction to research writing. And today, uh, Dr. Madhurima Das will be discussing about uh, basics of writing. And I hope that you all have received uh, the workbook for today's uh, class. So please keep that handy. And the question answer compilation for the previous class has also been sent to you uh, along with today's uh, course schedule. So please do see that later. And if you have questions, we will be taking them uh, in at the end of the session, probably 45 um, uh, at 12.45. So yeah. Uh, so yeah, welcome all of you and I hope you're all charged and ready to learn about writing and research. So we have Dr. Madhurima ma'am here. So yeah, over to you ma'am. Good morning everyone. Uh, thank you so much uh, Meera and Niharika for supporting uh, you know, the happening of the class and uh, coordinating with the participants with all the material. Um, I hope all of you have that uh, you know, exercise book. So today's unit is on writing skills. We will be looking at a lot of things on grammar and you cannot learn grammar just by reading about it. So the idea of that exercise booklet is, as we talk about the components, you can look at the exercise, maybe attempt one or two things. And then at the end of the day today, I would like you all to actually attempt all the exercises. So because the session is only for two hours, you may not be able to do the full exercise during the course of the session but we want you to attempt it post the session. And then if there are clarifications, you're more than welcome to ask us uh, those over an email. So do keep it handy. If you are able to take a print, take a print, but you know, let's save paper. So if you can keep it online in a notebook, just make some notes now and later attempt it on the Word document. And that's why we've shared a Word document format for all of you. All right, so let me share the screen for today as we begin. Okay, give me a moment. It's just taking time to get the slide share. Mira, are you able to see the presentation? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Oh. All right, fantastic. At times it just, you know, takes time. Okay, so what are we looking at today, right? Uh, but quickly before that, what did we do last week? I meet you once a week and I'm going to do this recap. Anybody, one word, you can either put it on chat what did we do last week? Five first responses is what I will read out. What did we look at last week? Okay, cube. Yes, yes, Narsimamurti, cube. Uh, cubing, yes. Writer's block, introduction to research, process, audience, cubing, status theory, pre-writing, all of that, right? So we did an introduction to writing and we understood what's a pre-writing process. How do you go about it? We understood that the science and the social science approach has a little variation to it. We also understood that, you know, pre-writing has actually three different phases. And while it's important to understand the cognitive aspect of pre-writing, it's also important to understand that how you draft and how you finally do your revision is equally important. Yes, we also did speak about the Pomodoro technique. We spoke about Imrad. So there are different approaches, different techniques that we also spoke about. So today, as we move from the basic, right? Uh, before we proceed further, this unit looks at grammar. Now, while we asked you all about challenges, I understand that not many of you said grammar and vocabulary is your challenge, but you will be surprised that the moment you put pen to paper and you begin writing without a tool, a lot of us find grammar difficult, right? And a lot of times I have seen people even spelling out grammar wrong, okay? So these are simple things. Today's things are very, very simple components of writing, but very, very imperative. Because if I have to, as a reviewer for a journal, look at a research paper, it, it immediately puts me off if there's too many grammar errors, because I realize that the person hasn't given enough importance to proofreading, right? I'm not talking of the language. I understand that we all come from different vernaculars. Our language strength is different. That is not what I'm talking about here but not being able to do your grammar right, using the wrong words, repeating the same word again and again, shows that there is not enough effort from the part of the writer. So we will be addressing those components today, right? Like the last time, I understand some of you put your questions on chat and as and when can, I will incorporate that and answer it. But otherwise at the end of the session, like Mira said, we will do the 
Q&A. So what are writing basics? So what are we going to be looking at today? Okay, so this is what we are looking at. In, give me a moment. Okay, we are going to understand the key principles or elements of writing, which includes the five C's of writing, which is your clarity, your conciseness, consistency. Those are the C's. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you about 10 elements of good writing. Then we will look at persuasive writing. Why persuasive? Because as a researcher, you are looking at convincing somebody. As a researcher, you're looking at persuading somebody. You're persuading your community of researchers to understand how your work is important. You're persuading grants commission to give you a grant. You're persuading some journal to publish your work. So persuasiveness in writing is an important skill. Then we will come back to basic, right? Um, a lot of us, when we learned grammar for the first time, may have used the Ren and Martin book. Right Today, um, we do have that book. That book is as good as it always was. But today, we have a lot of writing elements. And like I said in my references in the handbook for Unit 1, I use most of the content from the Purdue Writing Lab because it's excellently put. Um, it's, it's a massive Pandora's box. So what I've done for the course is I've selected snippets of what I want to teach. And then I also supplemented with other online articles and other resources. So we look at the types of sentences that we write. Why is it that you shouldn't write sentences that are too long? Why is it that short sentences are important? Why do short sentences get our attention? We will look at these components. Then we will look at what is appropriate language. Okay, we look at, look at a couple of, couple of things on that. What, what do I mean when I say appropriate language? What is it that's a big no when you're writing? What is it a good thing when you're writing? Right? Then we will look at the next thing, which is quite the devil in the writing, which is the active and passive voice. Right? A lot of times we forget that scientific writing is ideally in the passive voice and not the active voice. And often students are very, very worried. You know, ma'am, what is the tense? What is the voice that we should use? Should we write in first person? Should we write in third person? Right? Should we write, um, Mira did this research? Right? I'm going to use Mira's name. Or should, should we say this research was done uh, by uh, a group of researchers who looked at something? So we are going to talk about that a bit. We look at gerund, participles, and infinitives. They are all different forms of verbs, okay? And they are, the reason I'm doing mechanics is our writing involves a lot of verbs, especially if you're doing primary research. Then we look at some basics of grammar, articles, prepositions, understanding few components of spellings. We're going to look at two important things which we use a lot in research writing and we make errors. Your handout on the chapter will include a lot more content. Okay, because of paucity of time, I will not be have the time to look at, but some of the main contents are things I have included in the handbook. Then similar words. Finally, we come to punctuation, comma, semicolon, colon, parenthesis, and dash, quotation, and apostrophe, right? Um, I'm not sure how many of you have uh, read this book on, uh, you know, um, the eats, shoots, and leaves, okay? Um, it's about, it has a cover of a panda, and the book is actually a fantastic book on grammar. Okay, uh, but it's, it's that a lot of times one uh, punctuation missing at the wrong place changes the complete meaning of the sentence. Okay, um, I absolutely love this cartoon of Snoopy and it says Snoopy's trying to write, Snoopy's at the typewriter and Snoopy says it was a dark and then Snoopy's walking around, you're walking back and forth. And then Snoopy says it was a dark and stormy night. And then Snoopy's thinking again, just like we do. Writing doesn't happen constantly. Writing takes time. Writing is deliberate, writing is with pauses. Okay, and that's, that's a reality. It's an eternal struggle for most of us. Even for us who have been writing for years, there are days when we have this. And so you have to remember that good writing is hard work. There is no shortcut to good writing. You will have to understand the nuances of writing to be able to write well. So what are the... Yes, you are asking me about the Purdue Writing Lab. I will share it. If you have looked at the references on my first handout, you have the link to the Purdue Writing Lab, which is the Purdue OWL, okay? It's called the Online Writing Lab. You can take a look at that. What are the key principles or elements of good writing, okay? There are 10 main elements. What is the purpose? Who is your audience? What is clarity? What is unity? What is coherence? What's completeness? Conciseness, consideration, concreteness, courtesy, okay? There's a lot of it, okay? There are seven C's in it, but a lot of times completeness and conciseness is combined, concreteness and um, consideration and courtesy is combined, and that's where it becomes five C's. 
okay but there are seven c's i have actually split up those components because they're very very deeper nuances of writing okay so the first thing first element of writing is your purpose understand your topic understand your purpose understand your goal a lot of you from the first unit had questions on how do you define your problem how do you figure out what you want to study and i said have clarity on your purpose define that research problem and that becomes important and to start with whether you are a master student who wants to get into phd at some time you are a doctoral student who is still figuring out your research proposal i think some of you are in that phase or you are somebody who wants to do a postdoc and you'll have to figure out a research problem that's related to a phd but a little little more uh, you know delving into much more details so you will have to create a purpose statement and at that point you'll have to understand that the filter mechanism comes back right the filtering the funnel technique comes back wherein you'll have to figure out okay what's the broad area i'm looking at how do i make it more narrow how do i focus on it okay so you have to avoid writing in generalities and unfocused paragraphs your writing has to be purposeful every para you write in a document you should tell me what is the purpose in that para right you're just not writing 300 words or 600 words to tell me one common thing across each of your paragraphs have to tell a story each of your paragraphs have to be connected each of your paragraphs have to have individual sub purposes right and that is why purpose becomes important you have a larger purpose and then you have smaller purposes for each segment of your writing a lot of you have asked questions about research paper research proposal thesis content we will slowly be covering those contents but you know given the length and breadth of the course we'll only be able to briefly tell you you know which will be like a guideline for you to work on okay now if you look at your exercise book i have given you a small box and i've said what is your research purpose okay i want you to spend the next 1 minute and just write write a sentence there what is your research purpose okay just write a sentence i'm not asking you to put it on chat this is this is not this is not a you know a space where i'm judging it i'm not this is a diagnostic exercise which means it will tell you it will give you an understanding how deliberating on and putting together a purpose can be challenging okay what is your research purpose your first exercise in the handbook i hope everybody has been able to access the exercise book yeah you need the exercise book for this unit without that you cannot do the session okay okay i do see a lot of yes coming in all right all right fantastic okay yeah have you written what is your research purpose your research purpose is going to be a work in progress but what's important is that you realize that what you write in that one line is what you then define further okay anybody would like to share it you can unmute i'll give maybe two people chances i know it's it's a large number but this is first come first serve based given such a large crowd anyone would like to unmute and share please raise your hand if you want to unmute yeah. but the first two people meera we look at the first two people shruti and sharmishta dhar are there okay all right so shruti and sharmishta dhar the first two people yeah over to you both yeah. come on uh, yeah hi uh, so uh, my research purpose uh, is to work on thermal physiology of lizards and i'm okay. looking at can you hear me yes i can i can very clearly yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. and i'm uh, looking at expression of heat shock protein in rock agamid so i just okay. managed to write two sentences okay so just the first sentence to study the thermal uh, what did you say thermal so, physiology to study the thermal physiology of research of lizards of is your main system. purpose yeah yeah that's it it's yeah, precise I mean, yeah and the second line you added is an extra information correct yeah 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 so that's that's how specific it has to has to be that's how focused it has to be all right thank you so much shruti for sharing that sharmishtha let's let's hear it from you Yes, ma'am. Uh, the line I have written is uh, the research I'm going to undertake aims at evaluating whether animals can be considered as a uh, uh, having moral worthiness or moral significance. Okay, so how would you convert it, uh, Sharmeshtha, without so many words, to understand 
the moral uh, moral compass of animals i don't know if the compass is the right word to understand the moral standing of animals to understand the moral behavior in animals yes can you yes. can you do that yeah so when i ask you for purpose right when you're writing a purpose uh, for your research paper for your research proposal for your you know thesis work you will have to understand it has to be very very crisp it could have multiple elements you could be studying to understand the moral behavior and you know maybe team dynamics amongst animals in a particular species so your purpose is still vague because which animal species are you talking about right so you can actually yeah. then narrow it down are you talking of a particular species are you talking of a herd of elephants are you talking of lions are you talking of monkeys are you talking of uh, wasps right so mm -hmm. depending on that the way you do your purpose will change okay uh, meera by any chance do you know who is the third person who would have raised their hand we have uh, chetan so chetan. chetan all right chetan tell me yeah, kamlesh has said to study the implementation of occupational health and safety laws for construction workers kamlesh that's a very well formulated research purpose and looks like you have already thought about it because it's it has your audience it has your sample and it has your um, you know um, independent and dependent variable Okay, I see some of you are sending it here, but yeah, all right. Who is the person, Chetan? Yes, hello, ma'am. Can, yeah. can you hear me? Yes, I can very well. Yeah. Yeah. So my purpose is to find a sustainable solution to soil stabilization in terms of slope failures and landslides. Okay, so you're looking at a natural disaster. You're looking at sustainable yes. solution. It's, okay. It's more in in geotechnical engineering. Yes, you can actually also define it further. You can narrow it further and give it a more crisp version. Just give that mm -hmm. give that some thought. Yeah. Thank you, Chetan, right. for sharing it. Thank you. Um, some of you have asked me if the purpose of the writing and the objective is the same. Well, purpose is the main thing. Your objective obviously builds on that purpose, and then you could have more sub objectives. right so i could be studying the impact of covid on plastic usage that could be my main research problem and my research objective could be to understand the uh, impact of covid on plastic usage and my sub objectives could look at what is the utilization of plastic what is the awareness of single use plastic what is the impact on communities and things like that right so you can have your purpose becomes your main objective and post that you could have smaller objectives a lot of your a lot of your putting it in it, it is there is there is clarity i see sharali i see um victor who have put it in yeah shamnuja okay okay those those things sound so the idea is what your purpose is the narrow objective right it has to be crisp it has to when i look at it i have to say wow okay this is what you're studying it has to intrigue me that's that's where your purpose comes in okay then your audience we did look at the audience last time but i'm bringing it back here because it's an element of writing okay who is the audience when we write what does my audience expect and the clear definition for example when i put the hand out together i know that you all have attended my session right i have clarity on my audience i know what is it that you are expecting so based on the feedback that i get during the session i also know which components to focus on so if you realize the hand out in chapter 1 has one component which is a little more deeper delved more deeper right i have given you more notes on some segments because i felt that was a greater need right so once you understand your audience you also understand how to write and when you are writing for your audience depending on who they are the formality and the informality of the word choices come in for example while i'm speaking to you i could say you know what let's let's park this thought right what do i mean i mean i'll come later to the question but if i have to formally write to you i will say we will look at this a little later correct so the colloquial usage is in an informal setup so when i'm taking a class with you i could still be using a little colloquial language a little informal language but if i have to put it on paper i have to make sure the writing has a formal tonality to it again in at academics you'll have to understand that the third person voice becomes very very important because it's more formal in nature than the uh, first person voice right so instead of writing i did this okay this was this was this research was carried out okay so that third person voice is very very important all right so the first two elements are those then let's look at clarity clear language avoid unfamiliar words avoid jargons avoid cliches okay be concise be objective okay i now want you to look at your first exercise i want you all to look at the first exercise the second one the simpler alternative for each word 
Look at the simpler alternative for each word. Okay? You have the first one, acquire can be written as get, difficult can also be hard, unprecedented can also be first. Okay, I want you to try and attempt two or three of them and then we'll move on. I want you to be doing this much later in the day. Audio is not clear, Mira. I have somebody who's saying the audio is not clear. Audio is all right. Um, Kokila, Mira, the audio. It's clear. Kokila, maybe there is something at your end. Just, uh, just maybe, you know, uh, reconnect on your audio, please. Okay. Yeah, location is place. Okay. So I want you to do this exercise. Now, what is the purpose of this exercise? The purpose of this exercise is a lot of times you don't have to use difficult words, right? You can use simple words. When I give you the handout, you know, maybe end of day today or tomorrow, I will share the answers to some of these exercises. Okay, so that you know, but you have to also understand that some of them have more than one word. Okay, the idea is what? The idea is to have clarity in your language. What am I speaking? You like, I think one of the questions that came in from unit one was, do we need to use jargons? You don't need to. Keep your language simple. Keep your language such that today when I'm writing, I have to connect with all 270 of you. Right? If I'm going to speak in a language which only I understand, then I'm not connecting with you all. I have lost my audience. So each of these elements of writing is connected to each other. Okay, all right, the next one, unity. What is the central thought? Purpose is one single goal. Unity is central thoughts and how the individual sentences merge in your writing. It's an implicit idea of the controlling, implicit understanding of the controlling idea, right? For example, you have all given me the purpose of your research. Now, if you had to write the first introductory paragraph on that purpose, what would you do? you will have to make sure that the main idea of the purpose is delineated clearly in that first paragraph of your intro. Because otherwise, as a reader, there's a disconnect. I'm like, Achha, the purpose is this, but the first paragraph doesn't even talk about it. You have randomly spoken about everything in the world, but you have not spoken about your purpose. So what have you done? You have missed out on unity. You have missed out on that controlling idea or the central thought. And each of your sentences there also has to connect, right? You could, you could start with a quotation. Some of you in literature may be writing quotations, but your quotation has to reflect your central thought. You could start with a poem, but that poem has to reflect your central thought, right? If you're somebody who's working on a genre of music, your music notation and the description of it has to reflect that central thought. You could be in any area, science, social science, humanities, any, any stream, any discipline, but that unity component becomes very, very important. For example, I have given this in your handbook, it's not to be done now, but just think of this idea. If I tell you all that write a paragraph describing what you would like your institution to do on annual day. And I tell you clearly, okay, it's 100 to 150 words and only 10 to 15 sentences. What have I done? I have created a boundary. I have told you, I want you to write this only in 100 to 150 words. And I want you to collate all your thoughts in just those 10, 15 sentences. You have to make sure that your end up paragraph is only about annual day. I don't want you to tell me about special days across. I don't want you to tell me of what you desire. No, your purpose is to tell me what is that on annual day, what do you want? So some of you could tell me that I want my institution to have a cultural program and have a job fair on annual day, right? For our final year research students. So what happens, you're connecting it to the idea of the annual day, but you're giving me a unity concept. You're giving me one controlling idea there. Don't put in too many ideas in a single paragraph such that I'm reading line one and line five is completely disconnected. So the unity is about that in writing. The next component, coherence. What's your complete picture, right? When you repeat words, what is it? It has to be logical, right? Unity is that, unity is also that. My sentences have to flow one after the other, okay? Look at this, look at transitional words, okay? I've given you a small example. Robert is very outgoing and loves to meet new people. Full stop. There's a punctuation. Full stop. Dash, Eric is very introverted and he truly dislikes meeting strangers. Your transitional word would be on the other hand. Okay. So a lot of times in writing, when you want to bring a logical order, okay, and you want to say that, you know, some researchers have looked at this component and presented this 
aspect of the study and you're giving one set of results, but then you realize that there is another set of researchers who have found completely opposite findings. How do you do that? You will have to have what we call transitional words. And this is coherence. This is giving that idea a complete picture and making sure that the order is logical by nature. All right, the next thing, okay, you have this, I have the exercise on finding single word substitutes. Okay, let us, let us attempt that. Find the single word substitute, your exercise four. Okay, your exercise four, you can just attempt one or two, but exercise four is about this. Exercise four is about coherence. Okay, which means instead of using so many words, you can actually just use one transitional word. You can use one simple word. What are we constantly driving at? We are constantly driving at the fact that writing is about writing well and writing in a simple manner. Writing is not complicating our thoughts. Okay. The next thing, completeness. Answer everything, all the questions of your research and check for the five W and the one H. What, who, where, when, and which. Yeah and one how. So make sure that whatever your research purpose is and your objective is and the sub-objectives are, you have completely answered that in the document. It's possible that the research paper you're writing looks at one single objective of your larger thesis. Then make sure that the research paper has completely answered all the questions that that single objective looks at, right? So for example, if I ask you all to share a piece of writing with me, I want it to be complete. I want there to be a connect between your starting paragraph and your ending paragraph. I want you to be able to close that narrative. You could choose to give me abstract narratives and leave an ending that's abstract for me to decide. But then as a research person, we cannot leave things to abstractness, right? Especially when you're doing your master's dissertation, your you know, doctoral dissertation, you, you have a purpose and you will have to completely mention that. The next thing, the next C is conciseness. Add only things that are relevant, right? I can actually talk about these 10 elements for two hours. But what am I doing here? Because I have so many purpose, I have a larger purpose of today's session and I'm covering multiple components. I'm also deciding what I need to focus on more, right? Conciseness is something right now as master students, as doctoral students, all of you should already know what is conciseness, right? So that is something you'll have to also determine in your writing. The last three, consideration. I will look at consideration and courtesy together, okay? Consideration is understanding the reader's interest, being empathetic in your language and ensuring integrity. How do you write your data? How do you talk about your data? How do you give credit? Your citation is consideration. It's honesty, it's integrity. We will look at research ethics, but even before that, it's an element of writing. Right now, I'll give you an example. Instead of saying, I want to send my congratulations for, where it's all about me, I'm focusing on your interest. And I say, we congratulate you for being selected to attend this course, right? What have I done? I have made the focus you. The focus is not me. So in some cases in your writing, you have to see where the reader's interest is. Okay, when I say, I will get back to you on this inquiry, you will see that Mira usually uses the we. She says, we shall respond to your questions. We will get back. So what are you doing? You're incorporating the simple component of empathy in writing. It is so simple, right? We should all know how to do it, but we often forget to do it, right? We will get back to you. We will let you know. We will make sure that we answer all your queries. What is the language that, that you know, the team um, that who's working with us has been using? They've all been communicating with you through consideration. The next thing, okay? Um, your courtesy is that being sincere, being polite, being tactful, not using unfriendly expressions, which means not using words that are rude, not using words uh, that can be, uh, you know, looked at as being some kind of, a, you know, a foul language. That's very, very important. Courtesy is important in writing. You could disagree with somebody's viewpoint. You could be writing an argumentative paper, but you have to be courteous in your writing. Okay, I'm not talking about yellow journalism. I'm not talking about articles where people are bashing each other up. 
I'm talking about research writing that's objective. Research writing that in an argumentative format also has to be very, very polite in its writing. Okay, the ninth thing, the concreteness, using facts and figures, don't make it vague. I want you to choose a vivid imagery, right? But build that by comparison, use data, use figurative language, but appeal to my imagination, but also give me facts and figures. For example, instead of saying, we have hundreds of applications for this course, if you, if you remember, one of the things was we received over 740 applications for the course and around 620 applicants were shortlisted. What have we done? We have given you data. We have given you concrete facts, right? Instead of just saying, oh, so many people are affected, right? Your recent Uttarakhand disaster that happened. We know so there were so many deaths and there are so many people who are injured. There are so many families who are impacted. There are so many villages which had to be evacuated, right? Give data, give fact. There's only so much you can ride on emotion in your writing and vagueness, right? So when you give fact, you increase the chance of writing well. Okay, so now that you know how to write, you have the 10 elements of writing. It's like a little, little thing you put in an envelope, seal it up and remember. Okay, it's not something that you need to look at and say, okay, does my writing have conciseness? No, it is something that comes with practice. And that's why writing is hard work. The more you write, the better you get at it. Okay, the next component that we are going to look at is persuasive writing. How many of you here think you're persuasive? Can you quickly do, I don't know, a thumbs up, some emoticon? How many people think you're persuasive? No, no, not persuasive. Achha. Okay, I have Debajit who says yes, Shruti says somewhat, yes. Janet says yes, okay. I'm not, as I know, I'm not at that moment. Okay, okay, all right. Being persuasive, being influencing is a completely different skill, right? There are some of us who are uh, persuasive by nature, by our personality, right? There are some of us who need to build that persuasiveness, which means we can't say no. Right? It's so difficult for us to say no. We have to think so many times, right? We have, to be able to convince somebody, to be able to be persuasive, to tell your writers what's required, you have to learn how to do persuasive writing, okay? I, I see a lot, of, a lot of responses, but I also see that in speaking, yes, in writing, that's very, very interesting, right? Some of us may, while writing, Kamlesh says, majority of women suffer from this. I'm not sure, Kamlesh, what's your sample to make that uh, conclusion, but maybe, maybe, you know, if you feel Mira, Mira is cringing her eyebrows, if you feel that many women are not persuasive enough, um, but then you should, you should meet our student coordinators, they're quite persuasive. So persuasive is a skill that can be built, right? Okay, so let's look at how do you make your writing more persuasive? What is it? Persuasive language is about convincing somebody. And how do you do that? By using facts, by you know, um, sharing values, accepting the arguments and conclusions and adopting our way of thinking, okay? Because you want people to agree to you. You want people to understand that you have put in a lot of effort to objectively place your research findings. And that's persuasive language. Persuasive language is not about arguing. Persuasive language is not about riding on high emotions. Persuasive language is about writing it with facts, right? The content of this course is not, is not something that's women fancy. The content of this course has been put together from multiple sources with facts and figures, with objectives in it, right? And your writing also can be persuasive by nature. Will it become subjective? Okay, I see a lot of, lot of opinions coming in, but I'm not going to get into dis gender dis uh, discussions because that can take away an entire uh, class. But persuasive writing is something that everybody, irrespective of your gender, Okay, irrespective of your gender, you can develop the skill. Now, how do you do that? There are seven tools and techniques of persuasive language that I'll share with you today. Okay, one is appealing to emotions and fear. Just look at this example. What is, do you have a desire to be healthy? You do, then you should buy millet-based uh, breakfast cereals, right? What are they doing? They're appealing to your emotion. They're appealing to your fear that you don't want to be unhealthy, right? The emotion, we are proud of our country. Right, And that's why we are looking at skilling programs with the youth. These are writings where there's appeal to emotion. 
right? There are, there are much more examples, but I've just taken two to show you. Evidence and use of jargons, right? Jargons in very, very technical writing is important to be used because then people know that you know the um, area of work, okay? But using data to exhibit knowledge becomes important. Statistics, expert opinions, all your citations in your work. Is that right? It's, it's, it's objective. It is something that has been proved. So it is expert opinion, your research findings, anecdotal evidences. When you work with a case study approach, a lot of us use anecdotal evidences and what are we doing? It's evidence, okay? If somebody is doing observation and they're making notes on that observation of a particular behavior, it is evidence that can be persuasive. Instead of somebody telling me that, ma'am, people in Bangalore are not following mask rules. I rather want them to tell me what is your data? How many people have been caught by the police? How many people were not wearing a mask? Which are the areas where people are not wearing a mask, right? So I want data to understand that you are being persuasive enough to convince me on that statement you just made. While writing, we also need to look at inclusive and exclusive language, right? Because inclusive language creates a sense of solidarity. A lot of us, a lot of us who are in social sciences, who are in humanities have to focus a lot on this. Okay, I think the burden of social science and humanities is the inclusive language also. So you say, a lot of times when you say people like you and me don't want to see this happen, right? People like you and me don't want to see atrocities on a minority group. People like you and me don't want to see animal-human conflict impacting animals in such a way that some species become endangered. What am I doing? I'm using inclusive language to convince you. The tone and the connotation. Right? While I speak to you in class, I do see some questions. I will respond to them in the thing. Um, I do see some things are negative. Yes, it is. It is especially in journalism and in news bites, right? Always a negative tonality doesn't help. Taking a negative piece of information doesn't help. How can you turn that to Make it sound positive helps. So instead of saying that so many people die of air pollution every year, if we say that, you know, if we have air pollution monitors in the city, it increases the lifespan of somebody by seven months. Right? The same thing, but how you twist and how you present the data. Okay? That tonality also becomes important. Yeah, that negative positive thing becomes important. Okay? Uh, Tone and connotation, How, what's my tone as I'm writing? What's my tone as I'm speaking? What is the meaning associated with it? Okay, for example, the moment I say health issue and health crisis, both more or less can mean the same, but health crisis sounds more dangerous, right? So what is the word we are using? What does it connote? What does it mean? How does the audience perceive it? That becomes important. So if you want to grab somebody's attention, you have to say this is a health crisis in our country. This is a human crisis in our country, right? So persuasive language is also about that, is about what does that word connote? How far reaching is it? How does it appeal to somebody cognitively? Then the next thing, images and visual representations. I don't have to say much on this because I'm sure a lot of you had experience of doing presentations, but the idea of doing the poll in my first class was that I wanted to get your attention. I wanted to see what it is. Right? And with so many of you attending the course, I felt that the poll is a good way to break ice. Right? Ideally, if I had a small group, I usually do some kind of an icebreaker. But for me, the poll worked like an icebreaker, wherein I, I delved a little into what you're thinking. And then I weaved that into the narrative for the class. Okay? So that's how you use image, use visual representations. If I use a little cartoon here to tell you how writing is hard work, it's because I don't want to sound all serious. I don't want to sound like, you know, I'm giving gyan, but I want you to understand. And what have I done? I've used humor, right? So that becomes very, very important. Again, language, we already spoke about it, whether we're writing formal or whether we're writing colloquial language. It's important to understand that. In some situations, formal language is more persuasive. And in some situations, colloquial language is more persuasive. There's a question here, uh, Mira, that I will take where Shahjuddin asks me, there must be some factors which are more persuasive than other tool. 
why reasoning and rational no reasoning and rational is an important tool of persuasion too but i will expect that reasoning is important to you reasoning and rationality is also system system uh, you know to thinking right so we will be looking at it but reasoning and rationality has no there is no um, how would i put it you cannot do away with reasoning and rationality so it is an obvious thing so that's why i didn't put it as a tool of persuasion i would expect that as researchers you would be rational and as researchers you would know that you will have to reason out your objective so the tools that i have put here are things that are evident more in writing i ho i hope i have answered your question right but thank you for bringing that in right finally imagery sorry yeah finally we have imagery can you see this meera have you lost the presentation from me yeah we have lost the presentation give, give me a moment okay um i think by mistake just press that okay and finally we have imagery and figurative language which i said how do you use it all the use of metaphor simile imagery right is about appealing is about persuading me okay for all of you who are interested more on persuasion please look up uh, robert cialdini's persuasive techniques okay uh, while um, the uh, cialdini has written this more from an economic and management perspective i think there are also tools that you can use to understand persuasion okay i will maybe add that in the handbook meera do give me a reminder end of day i will hand that uh, add that in my handbook but that's an extra thing that you all can look up there's a wonderful video on youtube on cialdini's persuasion techniques okay it's called the science of persuasion that's the name of the video okay so if you use metaphor for example when you see india as a fabric fabric woven of many colors what are you talking about you're talking about diversity if i say citizenship was thrown around like confetti it is like simile it's like everybody was given citizenship right or i say bodies were piled up in makeshift roadside graves and in gutters what am i doing i am appealing to imagery the moment you read a line like that it you you automatically imagine it right when we had the pandemic and the initial covid cases really went up and hospitals couldn't deal with you know patients who who passed from covid okay and they had to um, you know take away a lot of bodies they had to cremate them in groups i think that is something that at that point the news that came out was about imagery but what happens you stand up and you take notice and that is why persuasive tools become very very important whether we look at emotion and fear whether we look at evidence and use of jargons whether we look at tone inclusive exclusive language images formal colloquial format of the language imagery and figurative language yes there is a notion of rational persuasion cialdini's work looks at rational persuasion it is rational it's it's is based on a very scientific algorithmic process in the mind okay let's now move on to like i said the devil in the pandora's box often often something we struggle with which is sentence writing okay uh okay let me ask this question how many sentences in a paragraph anybody you can put that on chat how many sentences in a paragraph 7 to 8 4 to 5 15 10 to 20 depends <laughs> okay 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 all right if you have a if you have a page of writing okay one a4 page for an example can have about 300 words approximately okay you will have to have around at least three paragraphs okay and this is this is more from looking at writing from a visual perspective also i don't want to read one entire paragraph which is one page which is 300 words okay so i'm talking to you from perspective of breaking down the writing but it doesn't mean you break it down incoherently which means it's the same thought but you have just just for the sake of it broken it down no so every paragraph has to have unity has to have coherence has to have conciseness and completeness those four c's are important but then your paragraph shouldn't be too long okay ideally 7 to 10 sentences in a paragraph is very very good 7 to 10 sentences right each sentence is how many words is about 8 to 10 words so each paragraph is about 80 to 100 words okay from a writing perspective that's appealing 
that's nice to read okay it also shows that there is some amount of you know you're breaking out the ideas you're making it simpler to understand it's easier to comprehend when you write it like that okay what are the different types of sentences does anybody know what are the different types of sentences middle school grammar is somebody writing on chat what are the different types of sentences declarative assertive simple complex okay assertive imperative or types i'm talking they are like much complex i'm talking of basic passive and active passive and active are voices interrogative simple complex compound simple complex compound present tense declarative assertive okay that's let's, let's take it a few notches to the basics okay a sentence writing is of four categories but i'll come to that but before that we are going to look at sentence variation how do you vary your sentences right just now i said okay you know what you should have a lot of different uh, you know paragraphs you should have things that connect but what do you need to do there right why is it important for you to vary your sentences when you write why is it that you should have a combination of simple and complex simple and compound okay why do you need that because then you eliminate monotony right you'll have to make sure your sentences length varies do not repeat the same thing four five times in one page right add emphasis where it's required when there's a long sentence lot of information is what you're putting in if there's a short sentence it means you're at your crucial points so work backwards you want to say something really really crucial write it in a short sentence it grabs attention you want to give a lot of information use your semicolon use your sub phrases right and write your long sentences subject object are components of a sentence past present declarative are tenses yes yes connection yes connecting um, components are there i will be looking at all of that too okay so what are the two strategies to ensure that you're varying your sentences well while writing one is vary the rhythm okay why am i saying this i'm looking at it from a reader's perspective how would i like to read that's how you would also want to write okay so if i say i went to the music concert at the manfo convention in bangalore the biggest coincidence that day happened when anuj and i ended up sitting next to each other at the concert we are both great fans of the band that was playing while i love the rendition of the old classics he loved them incorporating rap into the typical songs okay it was just a fabulous evening what have i done i varied the rhythm it's a paragraph with about four or five sentences but i have varied the rhythm of the sentences there are some short sentences and there are some long sentences this way i eliminate monotony while reading the simplest way to understand this is think of a new piece you have read this morning or think of a book you're reading fiction non fiction academic anything and think of things that you remember from books right think of writing styles that you like you will realize that you will like things that are not monotonous you will like things that are not long drawled you like things that use facts and figures right as a reader what you like in a particular writing is also what you should be able to replicate as a writer okay so one is varying the rhythm by alternating the long and the short sentences the next thing is vary your sentence opening i'm showing you two simple examples do not overuse the it this and i okay so i have taken an example from the previous paragraph itself the biggest coincidence that day happened when anuj and i ended up sitting next to each other at the concert okay and what have i done here i have actually then given you six different ways to write the same sentence by varying the sentence opening so i have said coincidentally anuj and i ended up sitting right next to each other at the concert in an amazing coincidence anuj and i ended up sitting next to each other at the concert when i sat down at the concert i realized that by sheer coincidence i was directly next to anuj by sheer coincidence i ended up sitting directly next to anuj at the concert what are the odds that i would have ended up sitting right next to anuj at the concert unbelievable i know but anuj and i ended up sitting right next to each other at the concert do you do you see what's happening right same sentence six different ways there are much more but what i'm saying is you grab the attention of the reader right and you know that one sentence can be written in multiple ways 
So to make sure that your writing doesn't sound repetitive and you're not using the same sentence again and again and again, you should learn how to vary your sentences, right? A simple thing. There's a lot more on sentence writing, but I have, I have sharing with you what's immediately very, very important, right? Now let's look quickly look at the four types of sentences. Okay, what are the classifications based on? What we call independent clauses and dependent clauses. So independent clause is something that makes a complete sentence on its own. The class today is at 11 a.m. is an independent clause. Okay, the dependent clause will need another clause to make a complete sentence. Okay, so independent can be by itself. Dependent is something that needs another sentence to complete. I was rushing for the class today. Sounds very vague, it's actually a dependent class. I had the class, you know, the research writing class was at 11 a.m. and I was rushing for it. I have used a conjunction, I've used and to co combine the two sentences. Okay, a simple sentence. I'm not going to dwell too much about it because this is very, very basic, but you need to understand this because you need to understand how to vary sentences. Okay, um, as much as possible, avoid complex compound sentence in research writing. Okay, simple compound at times may be complex, but avoid complex compound sentences in writing because by the time the person's read the entire sentence, they have lost you because it's almost 30 words in a sentence. Okay, so simple sentence, for example, my friend enjoyed the movie, one independent clause, no dependent clause, nothing else to it. Okay, uh, 289 stu uh, 288 students have joined the course. Okay, compound sentence, which has multiple independent clauses, but no dependent clause. So they're two different sentences. They could be there by itself, but then I can add them. The clown frightened the little girl. The girl ran off screaming. They could be related, they could not be related. But here I've related them and said, the clown frightened the little girl and she ran off screaming. Okay, the complex sentence is a sentence with one independent clause and at least one dependent clause. After Mary added up all the sales, she discovered that the cupcake stand was 20 rupees short. Okay, so what's a dependent clause? The cupcake stand was 20 rupees short is actually a dependent clause because it's dependent on the fact that only when Mary added up the sales, did she realize that there was a mistake in the addition. Complex compound is what? Lot of independent and at least one dependent. Catch-22 is widely regarded as Joseph Heller's best novel. And because Heller served in World War II, which the novel satirizes, the zany but savage wit of the novel packs an extra punch. There's so much happening there. Now, what's the problem with using that in your writing? It's complex, right? So it's best avoided, okay? Unless absolutely necessary. And your paragraph is talking about multiple elements and you can actually put semicolon, semicolon and make subphrases and add it. Okay, so keep your writing simple. Understand this because you need to know that if two sentences are related to each other, you can join them. That is a basic understanding from this uh, slide. Okay, also know that writing too many short sentences is difficult. In a paragraph, don't have all short sentences. Like we said, vary, vary the rhythm. Write one short, one long. That doesn't mean you sit and count. Madhurma said one short, one long, so I'm going to count. No, write it naturally. Understand how the natural flow is. Some of us invariably write long sentences. So when I edit journal manuscripts, okay, I also do editing work. I, I, I always tell my um, you know, researchers that please shorten your sentences. You have yourself forgotten what you've written in the beginning of the sentence because your sentence is like 30 words long. Okay, so break down your sentences, keep them short, make sure that the rhythm is there and make sure that you have connected. There's unity in that entire paragraph with multiple sentences in it. Yes, Niharika, in literary criticism, critics do deliberate from complex compound sentences, but again, um, not everywhere can you use complex compound sentences. But it's true because when you are critiquing work, right? When you're looking at literature, you will be dealing with a lot of complex compound sentences. Okay, that's, be that's because of the genre of research that you're doing. 
But if I have to look at basic research writing, most of us do not actually deal with complex compound sentences. Okay, the next thing, like I said, we are going to look at what is appropriate language. Okay. So what is appropriate language according to you? Anybody on chat? What is appropriate language? Let's see, I have a couple of responses. I'm just opening up the chat box. Pleasing, not offensive, decent language, meaningful, concise, straight to the point, direct, fits well in the con context. Empathetic to the audience, okay, okay, form, yeah, decent, politically correct, okay, suggestive, which suits to the situation, okay, okay, lot, all of this, all of this, all of this, and a little more, okay, so what's appropriate language, let's, let's look at this. When it's writing, it's important to use language that fits your audience and matches your purpose. We go back to the first two elements of writing, right? Every subcomponent in today's session connects back to those 10 elements that we started our session with, okay? So when you're writing, very important that you not only understand your audience, but you also understand the purpose and inappropriate language can actually damage your credibility. Like you said, if you use foul language, if you use language that's not nice, that's not empathetic, it damages your credibility, right? So you could be doing fantastic work, but if you are not kind in your language, it damages your credibility. It undermines your argument. If you're randomly writing vague things, Right? Like I said, if there's lack of persuasiveness in the writing, it also undermines your argument. And somewhere it alienates your audience. So I have picked up this book because I want to read about it. But there's so much jargon, there's so much of unnecessary detail that I've completely lost it. The author has alienated me. How many of us at some point have picked up a book and stopped reading it because we felt that we were alienated from the author? How many of you? Yes, no, not sure, never had it. Yeah, so you picked up the book with great enthusiasm and then you're reading it and you're like, okay, you lost me. I, I don't know what you're saying, right? It happens to us sometimes, okay? But many of us may have had at least one experience where we feel alienated by the author. For me, as a facilitator, the biggest challenge is when I'm talking to so many of you on a virtual platform is to ensure that I make my language empathetic is to ensure that I give all your questions as much importance as we can. Obviously, we have the team which is putting together all your questions and I'm responding to them again. And during the course of the session, also I try and look up and see, but what are we doing? The same empathy has to translate when you're writing. It becomes very, very important, right? Now let's look at a couple of things. The level of formality, right? If you're writing a normal article, which is going to a newspaper, it may not have to be as formal as if you're writing for a journal. And then obviously journals have their specific requirements, specific objectives, okay? And it is something that you will have to follow. You cannot say, I don't care, right? If a journal is telling you, we want your paper in this format, you'll have to follow the format. Okay, that's where the level of formality comes in in writing. One of you said, I think Sunil Kumar said, that a lot of times in academic books, even though we feel alienated, we have to read it for the course. Yes, at that time, we'll have to treat with, treated with the lens of what is the knowledge you're gaining from it, right? Unfortunately, a lot of academic books may have writing or writing styles which can alienate us, but I think that has changed over the years, okay? I think today um, authors are also putting in more case studies, authors are trying to put in more exercises. The way books are being written, even for an academic audience has changed over the years. Okay, but yes, I have to admit, I can speak of it from the perspective of psychology and from the perspective of management, but I understand that in a lot of other fields also today, authors are making that effort to connect with the audience, right? So a professor of mechanical engineering, while writing the book may also have anecdotal evidences, wherein they talk about an incident where they discuss something with the student. So people are trying to bring in that human element into writing. Okay, the next thing in group jargon, which is a specialized language, right? Used by groups of like-minded individuals. I come back to my example from last year, uh, last class, where I said that if you're attending a conference on say earthquake technology, all of you understand that language, right? But if you're attending a conference, which is on a very specific component, then only a small group of people will understand that jargon. 
at that point what what happens it becomes an in group jargon so you will have to understand when is a jargon an in group jargon and by using that are you alienating your audience are you making sure that because you are using the jargon somehow people are not coming and talking to you people are not reading what you are writing right so while the in group jargon has its advantages because you connect very strongly to people of your own research group you have to understand that in a larger space that could also alienate people around you right slang idiomatic expressions never to be used never to be used unless you are writing it unless your paper is talking about local cultures and you are using slangs or you are talking about it right for example i i do a session on cultural sensitivity and i do it with a client who have companies in australia and new zealand and i actually teach a segment on slangs because it's a culture where even in an official setup people use words which are considered very very colloquial which are considered like you know the slangs are very appropriate for them so it's a cultural difference right your high context cultures your low context cultures how do they look at but in academic writing um ideally do not use slangs and do not use expressions that um you know are not inclusive expressions that can be seen as being very very demeaning to a particular group or a particular uh, segment of people never use deceitful language never use euphemisms which means what don't blow things out of proportion right don't exaggerate too much right while exaggeration can be a style of persuasion if you exaggerate beyond a point it's deceitful in your writing right don't say every participant uh, you know found that this research was very very helpful correct do you see what am i doing i am raising the uh, level of exaggeration okay so we have to learn to avoid that and finally do not use biased language be very very sensitive be very very inclusive understand if a language you are using is gender biased is racial biased is ethnicity biased okay so you'll have to keep these things in mind and these are all the components of appropriate language okay i'm going to take this question here as i do the session victor you have asked me about if you are studying sexuality how you do you get away from uh, slangs what you have to understand is in the context of your language and your area of work some of these terminologies are slangs but their terminologies for reference to people right and so in such a case you can always have a footnote which says that this is the common reference for people okay victor i hope i have answered your question so when i say the appropriate language i mean it in general writing but in some of your specific research not just your work victor in somebody else who is say talking about practices in a particular tribal region or looking at like i said cross cultural uh, references to language you will notice that in some cultures it's it's appropriate to use it so at that point it may it may come across in your writing but then as a writer you will have to take the responsibility and maybe have a footnote or have a remark somewhere which makes sure your audience understands that you're not using it just for the sake of it remember language has a context and in writing that context becomes very very important okay all right so let's look at the next component for today active and passive voice all right hmm what is an active voice what is an active voice anybody what is an active voice i eat rice <laughs> so subject in first person subject is important okay okay that's that's an active voice yeah, i i like that i eat rice yeah okay let's let's look at what this means okay in a sentence when you using active voice the subject of the sentence is performing the action that's exp expressed in the verb component okay so the dog bit the boy that's an active voice scientists have conducted experiments to test the hypothesis the scientist is the subject of the sentence they are doing the work so it's an active voice um uh, most non scientific writing uses most non scientific writing uses active voice okay uh 
it helps because a lot of times it's very clear okay uh, it doesn't make the sentence complicated most of these become simple sentences and even in writing at times too much of passive voice can cloud the meaning so sometimes some writers okay some writers may use a combination of active and passive voice in some segments okay but however largely scientific writing is passive voice so let's look at some examples active voice over one third of the applicants to the school failed the entrance exam passive voice the entrance exam was failed by over one third of the applicants to the school okay then let us look at the next component which is she slammed on the brakes as the cars sped downhill the brakes were slammed on by her as the car sped downhill so you can recognize a passive voice expression because the verb phrase includes things such as am is was where or been okay so these are very detailed things that i'm saying yes you can switch between active and passive voice at times in the same research paper but again it depends so if you are talking about a researcher experience segment you are talking about some qualitative analysis sometimes people may shift but ideally your entire writing should be in passive voice now in scientific writing what happens passive voice is more readily accepted because it allows one to write using personal pronouns or names of particular researchers also as the subject so research will be presented by pooja at the conference it's a passive voice okay this practice helps to create the appearance of an objective it's a fact based thing okay and you're not really attributing it to particular agents but you're just saying things as they are okay it is giving you information which is not limited or which is not biased so the entire thing of personal interest doesn't come in it doesn't get clouded by personal judgments and that's why we use passive voice in writing please look at your next exercise please look at your next exercise okay change passive to active voice that's your exercise 5 okay exercise 5 we i had this thing of uh, converting from vague to specific okay uh, the example was i have read many research papers from my literature and looked at multiple themes from my study topic i want you to attempt this later today at home okay wherein i want to see if you can actually convert that to something specific okay your exercise 6 passive to active voice this book is being read by most of the class that's the passive voice how do you make it active in the same paragraph ideally do not shift and yes like i said in qualitative writing use of i is much more accepted now most of the class read the book yes narsimha correct right or most students read the book you could write it differently but what happens in active voice you have the subject who becomes prominent right and in passive voice the verb component becomes prominent okay do do this exercise later today okay so that's a lot we have done okay what are the things we have looked at because it's an hour i'm going to quickly recap what we did in the last hour and then we will move on to look at the next component we looked at the elements of writing right after looking at the elements of writing we also looked at understanding what is appropriate language and after we looked at appropriate language we also looked at passive and active voice right these are the different things that we did in the last one hour what we'll now look at is we will try and understand what is gerund what is participle and what is infinitive nobody will ask you if your research paper has gerund participle and infinitive okay so this is not like an exam question but why do you need to understand the mechanics of writing because when you're writing it you will realize at times that you know what the sentence doesn't sound right but you're not able to figure out why does the sentence not sound right it's because you have missed out on understanding your participles infinitives and your gerunds okay and this happens because these are all different forms of verbals or verb based writing okay so i'm going to quickly tell you this i am going to put these in your notes so do not worry about it right every component is going to be in your handout a gerund is an ing verb and functions like a noun right traveling might satisfy your desire for new experiences traveling is a gerund okay but it's a verb with an ing and so here traveling is a noun that's what a gerund is do we get it okay it is a verb that functions like a noun they do not appreciate my singing 
Singing is a gerund. Okay, it's a noun. My cat's favorite activity is sleeping. Now, as middle school uh, children, we were told that any verb with ing is a gerund. If you go back and remember, right? But at times, even a participle can be a gerund, can be an ing verb. Okay, but gerund is basically something that functions like a noun, that functions like an idea, that functions like an activity. Yes, red is an ongoing thing. It's a present continuous thing, Neeti. So you say red, read, right? It's the pronunciation here that changes. Also in the writing, yes, you can use it in the past tense when you're converting from passive to active. Because over there, the pronunciation makes a difference. Okay, what's a participle? Participle is also a verbal, which means it's a verb. But here it is used as an adjective. It is not used as a noun. What is an adjective? An adjective describes a noun. Okay? Beat in past tense is beaten, Rishabh. Okay, <laughs> some basic questions, but I'm just trying to look. So what happens? A crying baby had a wet diaper, right? You're describing the baby. It's an adjective. Okay, shaken, he walked away from the wrecked car. The burning log, the burning log, right? The burning is an adjective. Smiling, she hugged the panting dog. Okay, the questioning participants were happy to get their answers. Beaten is a past participle, yes. Okay, we are not looking at um, split infinitive sunil in this, okay? For that, I would have to spend at least six hours to do the entire detail thing on, on grammar. But what I'm doing right now is I'm giving you the basic foundation of components that you have to look at when you're looking at writing. Unfortunately, due to the paucity of time, we are going to only be able to look at this, okay? But yes, uh, there are resources available for you to read up further. Now, what is an infinitive on the other hand? So you see a gerund is a noun, right? The gerund works like a noun, okay? Your participle works like an adjective. Remember, they're all verbs with ing. Participle can be ing or ed, okay? Or en, like you said, so shaken. Okay, infinitive is something that consists of the verb to plus a verb, okay? So, for example, there's a stem form and an infinitive can be a noun, adjective, or an adverb. Okay, but it's in its purest form. Okay, this is a little difficult, but don't worry much about it. What I'm trying to tell you is when you write the sentence, as long as you understand that which usage is better or which usage is correct is what you should be able to identify. Nobody is going to ask you, tell me the infinitives you have used in your paper. But you should know as a writer, why does it become important, right? So in an infinitive, you give the verb, but before the verb, there is a to. So when you say to fly, to draw, to become, to enter, to stand, to catch, to belong, they're all infinitives. It is the participant's right to question the components being taught in the class. To question becomes an infinitive. Do we understand? It is the facilitator's duty to answer the questions being raised. To answer becomes an infinitive. Questioning might satisfy your curiosity, right? Is a gerund. The questioning audience had many, quest many inquiries, becomes a participle. Do you see how I'm using the same format? But then you will have to understand as a writer what works well in your sentence formation. To be, to be or not to be, okay? I'm not sure, Shamroja, what you're tell telling me, but... We all have to keep a grammar book. Yes, it's always, always important. The book is being read by most of the class. You can either say most of the class is reading the book, okay, or most of the class read the book. Both can be okay. Because being read is a continuous um, tense. Ground rule on what will work better? No, there is no ground rule. Depending on what you're writing and you all are from such multi- feels that I cannot tell you one single thing works, but you'll have to see how you're writing it. And you will know as a writer over time what is working and what is not working for you. 
Okay. All right. Now, a couple of basics of grammar. Okay. What's wrong with this? Quickly, anybody? What's wrong? What's wrong with this? Read the paragraph. What's wrong with it? Spacing? No. Use of he? No. Yeah. One moment. We have Nunchavi. Nunchavi Hatle. You've got it right. There's no articles. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Okay. Let us look at... Uh, Nunjavi, I can't remember which university you're from. I have to apologize, guys. I have read your profiles, but it's very, very difficult to remember with so many participants. Um, yes, there's no article. So he's the first person to respond. So this is your correct answer. A horse knows when he is going to race. How does he know? His breakfast was scanty. He's angry about that. He does not have a saddle on his back. He's being led, not ridden, to the grandstand. He's led under the grandstand into an unusual special stall. The horse is nervous. Sometimes he does not know what to do when the startling, starting gate flies open and the track is before him. If he does not begin to run instantly, other horses are already ahead of him. If you look at this, look at this. It's very difficult at times to figure out. But then if you read it two times, you will know there is an error. It's grammatically wrong. And that's why an article being one of the simplest things, one of the most basic things in grammar, we often make errors. People... When I edit manuscripts, it is very, very common that people miss out on articles and they do it all the time. It's the most common error I have seen in writing. Okay. So what's an article? An article is actually an adjective. It modifies the noun. Okay. So you have a and an and you have the. A and an is an indefinite thing. Don't worry much about the definition. The is a definite article. Okay. So, for example, if I say, let's read the book, you mean a specific book. If I say, let's read a book, it could mean any book. So, a and an are indefinite because they are not about one particular thing. But the means one specific thing and that's why it's a definite article. Both of them actually work like adjectives. They describe the noun. Okay, let us look at a course on research writing. It is an indefinite article. It could be any course that you're talking about. Let us look at the course whose advertisement I saw. So you're referring to a particular course. Okay. Then let's quickly look at prepositions. Used for time, extended time, and for place. Why, why am I doing article and preposition? Because these are the most common errors in writing. On, at, in. Right? It's about a moment in time. Okay, people often don't use since correctly, don't use during correctly. Okay, during my field work, I realized it's important. This is the result since you say the cause. It's important for you to connect. It's important for you to exp express extended time. Since 1960s, researchers have seen that. Okay, near Bengaluru, we have noticed that people follow waste segregation. Okay. Among the citizens of Bengaluru, we have noticed that people who live in the north of Bangalore, Bengaluru, follow waste segregation better. What are you doing? You're referring to place, you're referring to time, or you're referring to extended time. Okay. Uh, you will have to practice a lot of you who feel after this presentation today that grammar is really something you need to work on. Look at basics of grammar. Look at the owl thing. There are a lot more exercises that are there which you can do. Okay. Now let's look at some common spelling words. Okay. The most common thing that is often seen. Yes, there can be too many articles. So you'll have to make sure that you know when to balance it out. Okay. Grammarly is a good tool, but um, I have to admit that I trust my own judgment better. Right, because a lot of times Grammarly may not pick up smaller nuances in the writing. Okay, now common words, accept and accept. Right, accept is a verb, which means to receive or agree. He accepted their praise graciously. Your journal paper was accepted for publication. Okay, accept, preposition, meaning all but. Everyone went to the game except Alison. 
the number of times this has been people use one for the other without even realizing that accept and accept are two different words affect and effect a lot of people writing on experiments often forget how to use affect and effect affect is a verb which means to influence will lack of sleep affect your game yeah i want to study the effect of lack of sleep right will lack of sleep have an effect on your game do you see one is a verb the other is a noun effect can also be a verb our efforts have affected a major change in the university policy okay your feedback affects the narrative of this course the feedback that you give me will affect how i determine the next few units do you, do you see okay you will have to look and practice this this is not i am only kind of giving you a notion of what these components are but you will have to practice this to get better at this okay affect yes affect is also emotions in psychology yes uh, american versus british please look at what is your journal rule where you are sending it for and accordingly use it but most indian writing we follow the british rule okay the next thing please open your exercise booklet quickly you will see the exercise 7 and exercise 8 are things on accept accept and things on affect and effect okay yes yes adya practice is the key the more you practice the better you get at it okay but again your uh, practice ce is a noun practice se is a verb okay so there are lot lot more words like that okay all right participants okay i want you to do doing these exercises okay can somebody quickly tell me the whole array is out of step dash fred whole army is out of step dash fred except yeah defense and defense there are a lot of words a lot of words i'm only doing two common errors common er there's a book called common errors okay okay participants do look at it yeah except okay um the next one um affect and effect words dash everybody and their destructive dash last for generations effect as a verb with more examples okay uh, our efforts have affected a major change in university policy i okay the sleeping pills have affected her cognition okay um the uh, establishment of rapport between the different uh, groups of people have affected a mind shift change i hope that helps whoever asked me the question on effect and affect as a verb rishab i hope that helps yeah okay rishab i hope i hope you heard that i gave you two three more examples uh, okay rishab uh, maybe we'll take this offline okay you will have to practice when you practice it okay uh, you will have to read the moment you read and write you will also realize what's wrong okay affect is something that is a verb with only what will impact okay effect is something more it it is more about accomplishing affect is more about influencing that's that's the underlying thought when you write it affect is adverse to a large extent and is okay always adverse it's adverse to a large extent okay all right rishab okay now let us look at a couple of similar words yeah than and then than is used in comparison than is used in statements of preference i would rather dance than eat okay to suggest quantities okay then is a time reference okay she will start her new job then it suggests a lot of logical conclusion if you have studied hard then the exam should be no problem but these are again errors that people make than and then is a very very common error and finally we will be looking at off and off off is a preposition which in, indicates relationship okay which is belongingness and off is an adverb or a preposition okay but i have an exercise here okay so for example she is a student of class 
okay all right she is put off by the amount of homework they give her every day the put off is o f f the first thing is o f okay yeah put off okay off and off yeah all right the next exercise in your handbook is the off and off exercise and you will have to use it when it's appropriate you will also see that a lot of these grammar exercises when you write them and you read them that also helps you understand whether it's appropriate or not appropriate okay then i'm going to quickly look at something where i always comes before e in words guys neighbor way okay except except in some cases okay in most cases i is always before e okay i before e relief believe niece chief see freeze feel deal for example in some cases e is before i okay when it sounds like an a okay e is before i when it sounds like an a phonetically a receive a deceive a ceiling a okay the phonetic version do not worry so much about it but understand that there is an ie rule and the moment you speak out the word loudly you will realize the error you are making okay i also have an exercise on the i and e can you please okay ashika so i before e in words if you look at your exercise this will help you better for example you are writing relief you are writing believe okay b e l i e v e chief c h i e f yes pragya off the southern coast and so thoughtful of you good examples okay so some of these words always most of the time yes achieve i is before e most of the time i is before e okay but in some cases e comes before i especially if you have a c before that okay receive deceive ceiling conceit if you have a c before that in some cases then your e comes first and then comes i these are very small details but it helps you when you write so you don't make spelling errors and this is actually in grammar called the ie rule okay i have given you an exercise for you all to do please take a look at it and do that when you have the time today evening conceit yes there are a lot of examples conceit c comes first right okay okay ashika all right quiet and quiet yeah now it's q u i e t q u i t e the other quiet okay perceive yes yes all right but i before e has to be constant has to be one after the other okay the last segment today punctuation why is punctuation important because it creates emphasis okay and you have two clauses independent clause and dependent clause and that also helps you understand how to punctuate your sentences convenience yes lot of examples participants lot of examples you can keep writing words with i n e and you will automatically notice how the i n e rule applies okay if i have to leave it to you each of you can actually give me three three words we'll have a we'll have a list of 1000 words at the end of the day thief and thievery yes okay all right quickly comma semicolon colon comma is to join to independent clauses why am i teaching you comma because lot of times people wrongly use comma okay people just put comma randomly in a paragraph okay when you're talking about two short sentences use comma okay and especially with it if you're using a conjunction which is what is a conjunction right preposition tells you time and place conjunction is things that join sentences and but or for nor so for example there are more conjunctions i'm just giving you a few examples okay so you will have to understand how does this work for all of you okay often to separate elements in a series right on her vacation lisa visited greece spain and italy okay in the speeches many of the candidates election candidates promised to help protect the environment bring about world peace and end world hung hunger okay that's your comma semicolon is when you have to put in right two independent clauses and your second clause restates the first and both are important right that's where you use a semicolon road construction in bengaluru has hindered travel around town okay it's one independent clause the next important clause is streets have become crowd over crowd covered with bulldozers trucks and cones 
But what does the second phrase do? It reinstates or gives importance to the first phrase and both are equally important. That's where you could use a semicolon. Semicolon in colloquial language is to separate out multiple phrases. Okay, I like to, last year I visited the four cities of Delhi, Hyderabad, Chennai and Mumbai several times. Okay, semicolon. And I met friends in every city. Okay, the second one reinstates my first component. They are two independent clauses and they're joined by a semicolon. Long sentences often can be broken down. To bring in the variation in sentences, you can also use a semicolon. Colon is what? To emphasize a second clause, but colon is often like giving a list of things. Road construction in Bengaluru has hindered travel around town. Parts of Maleshwaram, Rajajinagar, and Matikere are closed during the construction. I can also say that when you're looking at a course on research writing, read up the following and put a colon. And I'll say journal papers, articles, newspaper, novels. Okay, so they could be two independent clauses, but I'm emphasizing the second one. And therefore, I'm using a colon. Yeah. Now, a lot of times you have to also understand how do you use a comma with a punctuation, right? When you put a comma, usually there is a space after that. Okay. And uh, when do you use and and when do you use comma? So you are telling multiple phrases. So your sentence is a complex sentence with multiple phrases. Before the last phrase, you will use an and and you will not put a comma before it. Okay. Um, I have several hobbies. They are singing in the rain, writing a book, okay, and cooking my favorite dishes. Now, before and cooking my favorite dishes, I do not put a comma. There are three different independent phrases. I have joined them together. I have used conjunction, but to separate the first and the second phrase, I have used a comma. But yes, we do have the Oxford comma, but there's a lot of controversy on the Oxford comma and the use of Oxford comma before the end. Okay, so I'm not going to delve into that, but I would encourage the participants that do share articles that you've read on it. Okay, but again, you will have to keep in mind how does it fit into your larger um, thing. Okay, yeah, R closed and were closed. R is present, were is past. Okay. The next thing in punctuation, parenthesis. What is parenthesis? Parenthesis is a dash. Okay, it is to you emphasize content again, but it's also often used for dates, clarifying information or sources from a sentence, right? You use the parenthesis here when we said Muhammad Ali, 1942 to 2016, arguably the best athlete of all time, claimed he would float like a butterfly and sting like a bee. Okay, it is not really essential, but it is something that can be important. Okay, that's where you put a comma. Okay, parenthesis, sorry, not a comma, parenthesis and you use it. Okay, and dashes are used when you want to either tell multiple things. So sometimes instead of a colon, we also use dashes. But if you're using a dash, then use dash across the paper for the same component. If you're using colon, use colon across the paper for the same component. Okay, quotation marks is about direct quotations. Okay, a single quote is when you want to emphasize on a particular word only. But if you're telling direct quotations, it has to be a double quote. I see people make a lot of error on this component. Okay, he asked, when will you be arriving? I answered sometime after 6.30. Okay, a lot of times it is used to indicate a ironic or a novel use of a word. In that case, the author may decide to use double quote. But if you're only going to giving importance to a particular word, the practice is to use single quotes when it's important to a particular word. The practice is when you're quoting speech to use double quote. Okay. Also, a lot of times when you're giving the title of a poem or a book, people use double quotes. Okay. The next thing. All right, the apostrophe, <laughs> okay. Three uses, one is the possessiveness of nouns. The boy's hat, which means the hat belongs to the boy. The hat of the boy. Three days journey, journey of three days. Okay, sometimes we use the apostrophe to show the omission of letters. Like when we contract a word, don't is do not. 
shouldn't is should not didn't didn't is did not okay sometimes you also put an apostrophe and 60 which actually means 1960 okay or if you put an apostrophe and 20 it could either mean 1920 1820 2020 so you'll have to be careful how do you use it okay and finally to indicate certain plurals of lowercase letters we often use apostrophes for example nita's mother constantly stressed minding one's p's and q's it is a phrase that's about politeness minding your p's and your q's okay um the 1960s equal to the years in decade you can also change it to 1960s were a time of great social unrest or the 60s which means it refers to the 1960s were a time of great social unrest okay i have given you a last few uh a last exercise which is on correcting the sentences and they are all about apostrophe yeah it is and theirs yeah theirs is in the plural it is is it apostrophe yes there are much more examples Okay, I'm going to open the floor for discussion because I already see questions coming in. Okay, uh, please understand that is a lot that we have put in in these two hours. Okay, the idea of this, this session being useful is when you go back and practice these various components. Okay, for some of you, you may have felt that the session was very basic, but you have to understand that we all have to constantly mind our P's and Q's about grammar. Okay, this is something that we have to we have to constantly look at. Yeah, I I see a question that a lot of you have asked. Okay. Uh, okay, Uddhav, you will be getting a handout, Uddhav. And I request participants to please be on time because it's going to be difficult to go back and show a couple of slides because we want to keep about 15, 20 minutes to about half an hour for Q&A. Okay, the N dash and the M dash. Okay, now I did not put it in, but what does it mean? It's basically about the length of the letter. Okay, now uh, N dash is a shorter one, which is to mark range, 1960 to 1970. So when you're saying ranges, or you say the age of the participants were between 20, between like in this course, I think the age range of our participants are anywhere between 20 to, I think some of you are in your mid forties, right? 20 to 45. So in such a case, I will use the N dash. N dash is the smaller dash. The longer dash is when I have to make a break in sentence or I have to separate extra information. Okay, we were looking at trekking in the range of uh, Annapurna dash and then i give you some more information okay so in such a case you will use the m dash which is the longer thing okay and the shorter thing is n dash i hope that clarifies all of you i see a couple of you who have asked me m dash and n dash okay the ones who asked me the question on n dash and m dash have you understood? Yes, M dash is also for change of thought when you are changing the idea in a sentence. But basically, it's about telling components, telling more components. MS Word mixes up M dash and N dash. Yes, Surya, that's why we have to judge our grammar better. There's only so much that tools can do. So you as a writer have to understand. And that's why we have spent two whole hours on understanding grammar today. See, often M dash and parenthesis is, is used um how do i put it um interchangeably but parenthesis is more about the brackets right you can put the bracket and within the bracket you'll have an n dash and after the bracket if you want to detail out more you will use the m dash you don't have to uh, send me the exercise book back that is more for you that is more for your reference all right mira do you want to ask them to raise their hands for us to ask the questions sure ma'am If you have questions and we will take them. All right, I'm going to stop sharing. Yeah. All right, so yeah, keep calm and write on everybody. Yeah, Snoopy also figured out a way. So let's let's. Have a question sharing. from Shamanujha. We'll yes. yes, yes, please. Uh, I'm trying to unmute him. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Yes, Shamanuja. Yeah. Uh, see, I have been in this profession of writing and editorial journalism. So now when I am now doing my PhD, 
So mm-hmm. what are the essentials? See, there is something good writing. Many of these things that you said are common. But if there is, there are some things which specifically distinguishes and being in business uh, writing with, with a lot of research. So we also try to be objective. It is not like normal newspaper writing. So what are the essential differences, uh, you, you know, uh, uh, of an academic writing, which is not there in other type of writing, especially uh, journalistic writing? Okay, business writing is very different, Shamanuja. It's a completely different uh, gamut of writing, okay? Or even journalistic writing is very, very different, right? Because when you're writing something for a larger audience, you will have to look at different kind of narrative styles. So you could choose the hero's journey wherein you talk about a particular component <coughs> and then you trace it out. You could look at a linear format of writing wherein you go fact and story, right? The fact and story narrative in journalism writing. So wherein you give a fact, you then give a timeline, then you give what has happened. You could choose a narrative like a situation, opportunity, and a resolution, wherein there is a situation, there's either a complication from it or a opportunity from it, and how have you resolved it? So journalistic writing, business writing, often looks at these kind of narratives, right? Hook, meet, payoff, wherein you have a particular component that you want to intrigue your audience with. So you ask that question first. Right. Most articles in business or journalism often do that. Right. You intrigue your audience with the initial two, three lines and then you tell them the main content and then there is a payoff. The payoff is not immediate. So your writing may not give me immediately everything I want, but you often see writings in journalism, say travel writing, wherein they'll say, "Okay, for more details, look up this website. Right. Or these are the places you can travel if you're looking to travel in, in the month of winter. What are you doing? You're giving me a hook. You're getting my attention. The meat is the content that you have created for me to read up and understand. And the payoff is something later. I'm not going to immediately book tickets, but the next time I think of traveling, I'll remember that article, right? So business writing, journalism writing, and and Shamanuja, you've been writing for so long, right? You would have seen how writing has evolved over time. And the fact that- My question was not so much about the structure, but the language. Uh, The language, um, can you clarify once more? What do you mean by language? I mean, are you saying that the language has changed? No, no, no. No, in academic writing, mm-hmm. the language that you use, and, uh-huh. and, and having said that, I, uh, in terms the journalism that I have been into all my life, is I write on business and technology. Okay. Yeah. So it yeah. is also not like, you know, travel writing or sports writing. Correct. So fairly factual arguments yes. and all. Yes. But yet, I find a significant difference when it comes to academic writing. Uh, one of the things is, uh, yeah, I, I, there could be many things. One of the things that almost everything that you have to s- say, you have to justify. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you have to justify whether by data, whether by citations. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, which for normal known things we don't do. So, and there is a debate in the, in the, in the academic writing also. Some of our, uh, you know, uh, guides and all, they ask us to uh, just ignore well-known facts. Don't cite or don't put data. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. some others insist, no, you should do that. Okay. Uh, so that, that formality. Okay. Let, let me give you a simple example. We say uh, that, um, you know, India has so many states, right? Now that's a fact. It's a fact that everybody knows. Okay. You don't have to give a reference for that. It's a readily available fact. But if you're then going to say that among the 29 states, so many states have an area that is larger than dash and dash, just just a number. What in such a specific information, you'll have to give citation, right? right? So looking at general generality of writing, some of the things you don't have to give citations, but when you come to specifics of information, you will have to give citation. For example, uh, today's news article talks about Karnataka had 30 districts. Okay, till, till I think uh, some time back. Now Karnataka has 31 districts. And the new district is particular old district which has been broken down and the new district is called Vijayanagar. Now that is a fact, right? So till it becomes a well-known fact, I'll have to give a citation if a student is writing on geographical um, you know, changes that have happened with states where states have been reformed over the last 15 years and say somebody studying that phenomena, they will have to give me citation on it. And does the audience matter in this case? Uh, the audience for which well, you 
yes for academic writing if it's for a journal and all that the citation component is very very important but for newspaper articles not not many times do people look at citations you just write the entire article and at the end of it you may give a link to the references from where you've taken the components of the article so if you're writing it for a generic audience or for even a magazine those citations may not really matter but for academic writing citations are very very important I hope I have answered your question. Uh, yeah, and uh, may I make a brief request that uh, all of you all be very brief with your questions so that we can take more of them. Yeah. Uh, also, raise your hands if you want to take, uh, if you want to ask your questions. Another small request is that if you could switch on your videos while asking your questions and also throughout the session in general, because this is an interactive session as well. So please do feel free to switch on your videos. We will. We are also taking attendance. This is a credit course, so we would love to see your faces as well. So yes, please be brief with your questions and raise your hands when you have one. Uh, we will ask Narasimha Murthy to ask his question now. Yeah, we are requesting you to unmute, sir. Please unmute yourself, sir. We are requesting you to unmute. Yeah. yeah. Ma'am, uh, like I have a question. Like, see, now uh, we discussed about all these ten elements of uh, writing. Yeah. And like, my concern or the fear is, like, while writing, we have chapters and sections, subsections, and paragraphs. Yes. So, like, how to deal with this concern or fear, like, of missing out all the these five C's and other things, you know? Because okay. uh, like when we write, like, it's not easy to you know uh, track, you know, uh, keep track of, you know the completeness or the clarity, concise and all those things. Like, uh, how do you, you know, how, how, okay. how can we address this? One? Okay, first thing is, uh, you know, do away with the fear because I think all of us are fear. You know, we all experience fear at some point. Um, the first thing is to accept that it's okay to have fear. The next thing is to look at how do you solve it? So, you know, each of your chapters, right, in a thesis or a paper, each of your segments have a particular purpose. So once you write it, if you remember the third segment of writing, pre-writing, which is revising and proofreading, that's where you come back and see, does, is, is there a connect in the story? So don't, don't write every paragraph and then think, is there unity, is there conciseness? It's going to be difficult for you. So write the whole thing and then come back. And when you do your pre proofreading, that is when you look and make sure those elements have been answered. And once you do it a couple of times, then it's an automatic practice. Then it's very, very unconscious. And then you'll be automatically, you will it's yourself when proofreading realize, you know what, I have actually written this, but I've jumped to a different concept. So maybe I should add a couple of lines connecting these two paragraphs. And this only comes with practice. But it's, but it's possible to understand that. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, sir. Uh, if we have questions, we can take a couple of them together and then maybe... Um, yeah. okay. So please go ahead and raise your hands if whoever has a question. So we'll collect the questions first and then she can answer. Anybody with a question, please raise your hand. Yeah, I'll be from Pragya. And then if there are others, please raise your hands as well while she asks her question. Uh, a very good afternoon to all of you. Uh, now my question is that uh, uh, in both the sessions you have talked about this like 5W and 1H. Mm -hmm. um, how do we have to take uh, that into consideration? Okay. okay. Now, um, Pragya, you have written your research purpose today as your first exercise. So I would add a second component to it. Now I want you all to look at the five... Uh, you know, W and 1H, and see if your research purpose answers those questions. Okay, can we do that? All of you can look at it. Look at your 5W and 1H and see if that research purpose answers those questions. Some of you, by the fact that the kind of research you're doing, you may not have answers to all the Ws, but it's absolutely okay. Okay, but at least you have to know who is that research for? When are you going to do it? Where are you going to do it? Right? These three components become important and how are you going to do it? So three W's and one H is compulsory in that equation. Okay, so your entire five W and one H, look at your research purpose and see if then you can break it down. That's, that's where it makes a difference. Okay, so I uh, will take more questions, ma'am. Uh, I yeah. can see in the chat box and uh, there are a couple of people raising hands as well. Yeah, yeah sure. Want to raise your hand, please click on the participants option. There is a more option there you can raise your hand. So please go ahead and do that. 
So uh, Gaurav, since he has uh, some connection issues, has typed up. Yeah, he's typed up a question. Okay. How much efficient is Grammarly when it comes to writing a research paper? Uh, Grammarly is... Uh... Uh, Ma'am, shall we take all the questions and then probably you can reply? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Great. So, uh, Upendra, maybe you can go ahead with your question. Yeah, if it is experiential and exploratory research, uh, I, I have to write it in first person only, no? Because how can I go for the third person? Uh, that's the question. And then if, if I am... Uh, actually establishing my way, uh, way of understanding our, or the findings, I don't know how to narrate it. Okay. Uh, how to um, narrate it, yeah. Okay. Upendra, I understand when you say experiential, right? You would like to write that, you know, I met, um, I met a group of people and we had a discussion. And I'm taking a simple example, right? Now, what is the practice? The practice is often that you write we, right? Even though you alone may have done the research, you often write we and you say that we met... We met a group of people to understand the practices, okay, on um, to understand the practices on health and hygiene, say, for example, and this is what we found, right? So one thing is instead of avoid the I in writing, so in first person, you can still write, but you could use the we, especially because yours is experiential and qualitative in nature. Okay, but you have to understand that at some points in your methodology, you will write that you write it in the third person. You will say that this research was conducted in the particular places and the sample consisted of so and so. The sampling technique was so. At that point, what happens? Your methodology chapter is in third person, right? You're not focusing on the I. So that's where in a thesis writing, which is a larger document, people do a combination of these two. So what also happens is if you're, um, you know, analyzing your primary research and your writing, you will say that, you know, the sample size and so and so the sample distribution shows that so it's all you're avoiding the I and V and you're writing your sentences. But then you can if yours is a qualitative exploratory thing, you can always add a segment which says researchers viewpoints, and you can write that segment in a first person narrative. But again, depends on your guide. And also a lot of times people in case study approach may use the first person narrative. So it's very guide dependent, very institution dependent. There is no single rule. But what I'm saying is the larger research work is written in third person and written in passive voice. Okay, thank you, ma'am. And we'll take more questions. And may I also request you to please introduce yourself very briefly while you ask the question you are. Uh, so yeah, we will take a question from um, Shraddha Singh, were you raising your hand before? Did I see you raise your hand? I'm trying to un unmute it. Yeah. Shraddha, we can't hear you. Am I the audible? Other, yes. The others who are not speaking, please mute yourself. We hear a lot of background noise. Good, good afternoon, ma'am. My name is Shraddha Singh and I'm working as an assistant professor in MLK PG College under SFS. And ma'am, mine is uh, more a problem than a question, which I face generally because I have got this habit of, you know, writing uh, in complex sentences. Whenever I write down something, I end up framing complex sentences most, most of the time, which I wish to avoid. But I don't know how it has become my habit now. I always end up having complex ones. So okay. how to avoid that? Man. Okay, Shraddha, the good thing is you have identified and diagnosed what the problem is. Okay, mm -hmm. so the next thing is go back to your elements of writing and see that are those complex sentences, Do is there clarity? Are you confusing your audience by writing complex sentences? So one way to do it is to, uh, you know, alternate between the things, alternate between complex sentence and simple sentence. So vary the rhythm in your writing, that will help you. Because if you yourself know you're writing too many complex sentences, you will lose your reader. Because I will lose it if I'm constantly reading only complex sentences, because I'll have to figure out what's come before the semicolon and what's come after it. Are those phrases connected to each other? Are you giving me a reason? Are you giving me a connect? What are you telling me about? Right? So Shraddha, like I said, the good thing is, you know that you are, you know, it's about identifying your own style. Okay, but complex sentences can be difficult to read and understand. So to increase the coherence level, maybe you can, you know, break down, alternate, you can do that, use conjunctions, break them down, use conjunctions to connect, use prepositions to connect, use, to, uh, use transitional verbs to connect. Okay, so you change the language and with it, it becomes more impactful. Okay, we'll take more questions now, ma'am, and then we yeah. can answer together. So Nida, uh... We can take your question, Nida Ambreen. 
We are asking you to unmute and you can go ahead with your question. Nida, are you there? Okay, don't see her. So we can take Sridhar's question. Sridhar? And Nida is here, I think. Um, yeah, okay. Nida, go ahead. You are unable to unmute. Nida is unable to unmute herself. Niharika, oh. just check. Oh. No, ma'am, I'm trying. Oh, she's unmuted. Yeah, yeah. yeah Nida, tell me. Hello, everyone. Thank you for this. Uh, ma'am, I'm Nida Farheen. I'm from Bangalore. I am an MTech graduate in AI, and my interest is in research writing. I have been fortunate enough to publish my work, but I think there's a lot of room for improvement. So uh, I just came across this term of, I'm actually currently doing um, policy, public policy uh, as okay. a field of interest. So there I came across a term white paper. Yeah. So it, okay. it seemed more like a research paper to me. I did not really understand the difference. Could you please uh, tell that, elaborate on that? Thank you. Okay, okay. Yeah. So um, uh, Nida, we'll uh, take more questions, shall we? Yeah, you want to like put a lot of questions and then I'll answer? You want to do it that way? Uh, yeah, I'll take a few more questions. Okay, okay. So uh, Sridhar is telling, uh, Sridhar is asking that editing services offered by journals, how effective is this service? Um, okay. And he has a problem with the mic. So uh, anybody else with questions? And Gaurav's question, yeah, we have already heard your question, Gaurav. I'm sure she'll answer it together. So, um, yeah. Participants can raise their hands. If you see on the lower panel, uh, you, uh, along with screen share, there's a button called reactions. If you click on it, uh, the lowest panel that you see is raise hands. Uh, if you click on it, it'll be easier to identify you because um, there are a lot of messages in the chat box. Sometimes if uh, by by chance that you raise hand, so it's visible and we can easily unmute you. Uh, please. please understand participants, we're a large number, Niharika and Meera are doing the best they can, yeah? So just, just use all the tools that are available. So if there are any more questions, please raise your hands, people. Um, okay, uh, I have the answers for any questions. questions. Yeah, so maybe you can answer them, ma'am. Okay, so I think we had somebody who asked me about what's a white paper and a research paper difference, right? Now, uh, white papers were initially, I think the terminology was used to refer to government uh, reports that were published. Okay, but today, if you notice a lot of policy documents, a lot of uh, corporates also publish white paper, uh, they have white paper publications. Okay, which means that they could be looking at a particular research that's been done, and they could be summarizing the findings of that research, adding some inputs of their own from their organization and publishing a white paper. For example, if you look at McKinsey, or if you look at Ernst & Young, they publish a lot of white paper reports. So the reports could be on team collaboration, on organizational effectiveness, they could do it on diversity and inclusion. So they're constantly trying to uh, publish uh, white papers. Okay, does that answer your question? So white papers could be an amalgamation of various uh, research work that has been done, or it could be delineating one particular research work that's been done by a large organization. And then, uh, you know, the organization putting its own input there. But originally, if I'm not wrong, the terminology came into force to understand government documents. And that's why a lot of policy papers are like that. Yes, it's like a literature review at times. It could be like a literature review, but not all the white papers are that. And we had a couple of questions about Grammarly and how useful it is and so forth. Yeah. Uh, gram like I said, use Grammarly, but use it with discretion. For example, your IE rule, for example, understanding which word is better or understanding not to repeat your sentences, right? Your Grammarly will not catch these things. So tools have a particular benefit for sure. And that's why we have them. But yeah. always use your own judgment along with it. Okay, thank you, ma'am. So... Um, Rishabh is asking. Oh, Rishabh has a question. Hi, ma'am. Uh, so I'm from Bangalore, and I'm uh, pursuing. I'm going to pursue further education in environmental politics. Okay. And uh, my question is: uh, when we write any paper or any uh, any kind of a grant or uh, uh, any white paper, uh, how do we assess whether we can, uh, you know, 
uh, our audience could be uh, from the United, from America or UK, because I always feel the conflict between the way we use verbs or certain sentences, which differ from UK to US. And that's uh, been my major challenge lately. Okay, okay. Um, that's a very uh, pertinent question, Rishabh. Uh, you'll have to understand, for example, with grant applications, you know where, your, where the mother organization is from, right? So follow that format. See where the mother organization is based and follow that in your English. Sometimes grant applications may also tell you their terms and conditions and may actually tell you the process and they tell you which language to use. Okay, but most of us in writing, we use British English, right? Which means we use a S and we don't use a Z. Okay, very simply put. So that is your rule of thumb. That's your heuristic unless told otherwise. But if you're submitting to an American journal, obviously you will have to use the Z rather than the S. But again, there's no single rule. It depends on who your audience is. If you're able to identify your specific audience, you will have to change. It's just like a journal paper. Each time you submit, if you have submit variations of the same paper to different journals, you'll have to still customize it to the requirement of that specific journal. But there are times that I've seen that with regards to tense, like for example, in the US, they would say something like, uh, you know, Rishabh, why don't you speak to your ability, you know, yeah. speak to your ability to write, whereas in UK and India, we say speak about. So speak, those are the- yes. Yes. So, so it's quite confusing, especially with verbs and the ways you like affect and affect also. Correct. So it is a lot of times it's also about understanding the cultural context. So you, the US uh, often they write like they speak. It's more colloquial by nature, right? It's a low context culture compared to if you look at a high context culture where the writing is very, very defined, the writing is very, very formal by nature. So this, like I said, Richard, there's no easy answer depending on your client. And if you have had some interaction with them, whether you speak to your ability or you speak about your ability, you'll figure it out over a particular period of time. And I think also, that, should, that should help you. Yeah, thank you, ma'am. Also, Rishabh, could you please uh, briefly introduce yourself because we don't know who you all are. So please uh, give us a brief introduction before you ask your question. Sure. So uh, presently, I'm unemployed, but I've been a business professional for five years. Uh, I'm an MBA, and I'm pursuing my masters again in environmental politics in the US. Okay, that's nice. Sridhar, we will take your question next. Uh, Shridhar, are you there? Uh, he's unmuted. Uh, okay. Uh, he has mic issues. So. Okay, okay. So I'll just read it out. Um, editing services offered by the journals, how effective is this service? Um, you will have to uh, use it and see. Uh, you know, some of them are good. Yeah, some of them are good. Um, some of them you will also need to do a little more work. Okay, um, it's, it's just like you're reaching out to people uh, who do editing services, right? So you have to see. It's, it's only, okay. you can only by experience, yeah. Sharmishta Dhar has a you question. Take Sharmishta. Yes. Um, um, good afternoon now, ma'am. Uh, thank you for a very illuminating talk. And it would really help me in uh, my research as well as guiding my research students as well. Uh, I have a question that whenever we are submitting uh, a, a scholarly paper to an academic journal, abstract forms the cornerstone of that paper. So uh, a lot of times the student face, students face the difficulty of writing these abstracts, which have to be very, very concise and include all the aims and objectives that the paper is going to actually deal with. So any, any quick guidelines for writing a very concise and informative abstract? Okay. Um, I'm, I'm going to give you three points, Ramishtha. Your abstract should have uh, the purpose. Okay. Your abstract should have the action and your abstract should have the conclusion. Purpose, action, conclusion. Yeah. Uh so maybe since we have heard many questions today, we will take the rest of them. If you have them in the WhatsApp group, we will be opening the WhatsApp group for more questions. And uh, just a couple of things before we wind up. Uh, am I audible? Yes. Yeah. Sharmishta, sorry, Viraj. Does that answer your question, Sharmishta? I'm trying to unmute you. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am, absolutely. Okay. Would you kindly very briefly elaborate upon that action part? 
Okay. Uh, purpose is what is your main uh, objective? Action is what did you do? Your methodology in a line or two. And conclusion is the impact, the implications. If you're doing something in a line of work where the implication is more on industry, then you have to write that implication. If the implication is more theoretical, where you're adding to the body of knowledge, it has to talk about that. So your abstract has to have a persuasive language writing in it. Okay. Right? So you have to get the attention and then you will have to include these three components. Yeah. And should it also contain chunks of arguments that have been used in the main body of the paper? Uh, your abstract is very small, right? It depends on what the abstract is. It could just be 100, 150 words. Yeah, some so so maybe, maybe just mention, but do not elaborate too much. You'll have to leave something for them to read in the main paper. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Sharmishta. And uh, I think with that, we are coming to the end of the session. So I just wanted to remind you all that uh, we'll be very happy to your videos on. And another thing that we wanted to say is that uh, please do be on time for the classes. If you come after 30 minutes, we will not be able to let you in. We are taking attendance very seriously as well. And uh, in the waiting room. Uh, I'm audible, right? Yes. So if you are in the waiting room, please uh, make sure that you send us a mail or you can WhatsApp us about uh, what the reason is. But otherwise, we would rather have you all at, on time for the classes. So please be here right at time. And uh, yeah, that'll be all. We will be sending you the handouts. And for further discussions, we'll be opening the WhatsApp group. Anything else that you wish to say, ma'am? Madhima, ma'am? No, I think, I think we're good. Uh, practice the exercises. You don't have to send them to me. We will share the handout for this unit shortly. Okay. Neharika, you have, if you have something to say, please add. If not, may I request you to give a formal word of thanks. Uh, thank you so much, Meera. Thank you, uh, Madhurima ma'am, for the fantastic lecture. And also, such a, uh, in such a short period of time, you could actually go through, like it was a quick revision on uh, well, like, you know, the basic mistakes that we still make in our research writing. Thank you, Sangeeta, ma'am, uh, for being the backbone and being there um, at every back and call for us and helping us. So thank you for that. Thank you, Mira, for coordinating the course. We'll, uh, Mira will be opening up the WhatsApp group. If you have any questions, you can put it up there. If you have any other queries, you can uh, personally WhatsApp Mira or me and also email us on our uh, uh, email ID, uh, Nia's Consciousness Program at the rate niaz.res.in. We'll uh, hopefully see everyone uh, in the next class. And the people who are joining today, if you have any other queries regarding the attendance and regarding the worksheet of today or other such uh, issues, please uh, feel free to contact uh, me or uh, Mira. So thank you. And the WhatsApp uh, link was also sent via email to everyone to join. We have two WhatsApp group running. And Madhurima Ma'am is a part of both the groups. So please don't worry about missing out your questions and answers. So thank you everyone for your presence. We'll see you in the next class. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Niharika and Meera. Thank you. Bye-bye.